All right, we are live. Uh, hello, everybody uh, who's ever joining us today. My name is Jeff Hoffman. I'm the uh, chairman of the Global Entrepreneurship Network. I'm just going to be the moderator today. We have three uh, excellent speakers for you. Um, we might even have more. Um, we know that at least one of the people listed uh, in the dialogue had something come up and couldn't make it um, from the agenda. So we'll see. But we're going to start with these three. And here's what we're going to do. We want to jump right in. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to have each of our guests introduce themselves, tell them a, you tell you a little bit about them, what they do, what their current company does, and maybe kind of an opening statement on their perspective of our topic today, um, which is sustainability and trust. What we're going to talk about today is brands have a, a big requirement. I'm going to say it that way, and you guys can argue it however you want. Um, for achieving trust through sustainability. Sustainability has become a bigger requirement, especially as the next generation of, of buyers and consumers move into the world. And the question is, uh, can brands remain sustainable? What kind of sustainability is required of them? How do they do it? How are they authentic about it? Those are the things we're going to talk about. So let's do this. Uh, Anrata, why don't you lead us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do and your perspective on our topic. Sure, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm Anuradha Agarwal, founder of a consulting firm called Think Not Consulting. Uh, I, uh, you know, consult brands on, you know, ma uh, brand creation, promotion, marketing, communication and marketing technology. I'm also India's top three uh, uh, marketers and advertiser under 30 years. I've recently been fo featured in Forbes India as, you know, catering to India's most admirable brands. I also happen to be on a board of directors of a company called Janajal, which is into safe water space. Uh, so we are democratizing communities through uh, safe drinking water. And we have also been selected as uh, India's one of the top five technologies to be able to cater to government's mission of safe water. And um, uh, I, I think uh, sustainability, you know, my one of the big mantra in life is like, you know, I was, you know, talking to Gary just before uh, this is, you know, every, uh, you know, for a win to happen, it has to be a win-win, you know, when everybody is winning, then only, you know, there's a real win. And I think sustainability perfectly falls into that category. And uh, yeah, so what I feel, uh, you know, the COVID-19 has definitely, you know, accelerated the whole sustainability. I think initially when we started off around seven years back, if only the one leg of business was sustainable, people used to call it sustainable. But I think, uh, you know, the pace at which we are, sustainability as a more holistic approach is, you know, what I see is emerging. And I think that's also what is, you know, good for the planet and society. Uh, what I feel, what it is, it is important also to notice that sustainability is a, you know, three-pronged approach, right? I mean, uh, we businesses will not be sustainable if, you know, th th there's not, you know, good enough resources, right? There's not robust resources, clean air or, you know, clean drinking water and a th thriving land. And, uh, you know, as we move, it is also very important to see uh, that the mindset which is around the resources, right? It is so, so most of the times the most expensive, uh, you know, thing uh, or like, let's say like, the most cheapest thing doesn't really have uh, has the most uh, most expensive repercussion on the on a natural resource. And that has to be balanced. Uh, you know, at Janajal, there's one thing that, you know, I categorically mention that, um, you know, for a thing to be valued, it needs to be prized. For safe water to be valued, it has to be prized. Once you start giving it for free, people start really, you know, the, that mindset needs to change around the resources, you know, for the sustainability to actually come in action. And, you know, last but not the least, I also feel that, you know, sustainability is very important. It is very important for sustainability to be profitable, you know, for businesses to thrive. I'd let the other, uh, you know, panelists introduce and sort of, you know, give an introduction to the topic. And then, you know, we'll go ahead with the discussion. Thank you. Okay, but one, one question before we move on. You mentioned about uh, the cheapest resource having the biggest impact. Can you give us an example of what you meant by that? Yeah. So sure. let's say plastic, right, Jeff? Uh, you know, we buy water in plastic bottles and eventually all those plastic bottles are there landing into the seas, right? Just because, it, the, the, you know, the everything that we buy from the market, whether it's a packet of chips or something, right? The, the, uh, the cost is so little 
but you know the cost that the nature is paying for it it's very heavy so i think that needs to be really balanced for you know for us to be able to move towards a sustainable future okay thank you that was a really good example uh, gary oh gary you're on mute you're still muted all right um, can you hear me now uh, you got it, buddy. Yeah. I had a feeling I'd do that. No uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, my name is Gary Barker. I'm founder and CEO of Ditto Sustainable Brand Solutions. And uh, I'm a product designer. And historically, as a designer, you're designing for swiping that item across a uh, UPC reader. And it's the sale of the item that's important. You, you sell more products the more successful the product is. Uh, and as a product designer, you don't want to think about what happens to your baby once it ends its useful life. And uh, all products do have a limited lifespan. And uh, I started getting very concerned about that. So in 2006, uh, I started a company called Greenheart Heart Global with fellow designer Larry Chernikoff. And our focus was to reverse design products where they would likely end their useful life. And we would look at the systems that were there to collect that product and reverse design it to, to stay in the, the loop. And uh, it was my partner that came up with the idea of design redesigning this. And this is the hated, despised, dry cleaning hanger that everybody has in the bottom of their closets and in their garages. And we looked at those and we found out that 350 million of those were landfilled every day. Then we started looking at other types of hangers, such as this that you see in retail stores. And our research showed that 20 billion of those were landfilled every day. And so 20 billion, billion hangers would fill 11.5 Empire State buildings full of hangers every year. So uh, we realized that that was our product. So we spent three and a half years researching um, the uh, apparel chain from clothing manufacturers to distribution centers to retailers and the entire supply chain. And we looked at what systems were in place to recuperate those materials in each one of those spots. And what we found was that recycled paper was the item that was uh, recycled both in retail stores, both flagships and mom and pop stores, and in consumers curbside. So we spent two and a half years researching this, uh, testing different paper um, substrates, uh, testing them on, um, in, in supply chains. And we came up with the Ditto hanger. And this is a hanger that's made out of highly compressed recycled paperboard. It's, uh, no formaldehyde, no heavy metal. Uh, it doesn't off gas. We use starch based adhesives and it worked beautifully in the retail and, uh, the supply chain. We could ship 20% more product in cartons using our hanger other than, you know, in comparison to a plastic hanger, we could fit 40% more product into, uh, onto retail racks. Uh, it was recycled with cardboard boxes at the retail level and, and at the, um, at, at the DC level. And it brought all these marketing aspects to it as well. Uh, that, that we could, we could, uh, color it. We could laminate it. We could design it in such a way that it would reflect really well on our client's brand. And so we've taken it to such a level. This is a hanger that we did for Gabriella Hurst in London. And we've taken it to such a level that we've made it from a commodity into a, a brand statement, really. And it's done a hundred percent sustainably. And it looks like it's sustainable too, which is really important. So my point is about sustainable design, that it's much more than just uh, making something out of recycled material. It's 
looking at how it functions, to looking at all the touch points that it, it goes through, is to talk to the consumer about sustainability by showing its recycled nature. Uh, and it's, it's making it valuable across the entire supply chain. And I agree completely that one of the biggest fights I have is with hanger buyers who buy plastic hangers and they're looking for a hundredth of a cent off. But what we have, our challenge is going through all kinds of different silos and bringing benefit to each one of those silos. So that's our challenge is educating our clients to such a way that, um, even though it costs more in the beginning, it ends up saving through the entire supply chain so that it's cost neutral. So that's a, that's a, a difficult conversation to have with these companies across entire um, closed silos. All right. So we'll come back to that because you both made a really interesting point, which is that uh, the front end of design and creation of products that become the non the sustainability problem in the back because they're not sustainable. And the people in that process weren't necessarily thinking about historically or incented to create a sustainable product, right? It's like you said, they were more uh, focused on the hundredth of a cent off. Um, and as, uh, 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 as um, you said before as well, those people, um, Anurada, as you said before that, uh, you have those people who are focusing on my job is to create this plastic tainer to achieve this mission. What happens when the mission's over to the plastic is not what they were focused on. So we'll come back to that. Uh, but let's bring uh, Francisco in as well to, to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Francisco Santolo. I'm a CEO and founder of Scalable. Scalable is now one of the leading training companies on entrepreneurship and innovation, disruption. And uh, we've worked in the last five years since we were founded in, in Argentina. We've worked with over 500 companies in more than 50 countries. We have built a network of over 1,500 global entrepreneurs and, and business people. And now we're working too with the governments and multinational companies. We're now with operations in 20 countries. So it's a, it's a clear uh, example of, of a new way of doing business. Our company is totally bootstrapped. It's, uh, it's has it has grown using our own methodology the one with the one we teach and our methodology is basically based in two pillars the first one is uh, continuous learning and and methodologies and learning from each other and the the second pillar is relationships and uh, when i think about sustainability i believe the the big change we are experiencing is uh, these terms become old very quickly. We, we started with social responsibility, then we started mentioning sustainability and triple bottom line. And now the thing has evolved into many, many terms. It's amazing the things I'm, I'm listening right now on this, on these topics. But, but the main point is the following. I believe uh, in this transformation more and more sustainability shouldn't be thought as a branding item or as a, as a design thing, even if it can be super powerful through design, as we saw with Gary. But I think it needs to be embedded into the business model and it needs to be totally thought from the business uh, from the business focus. Uh, I, I, I love the Gary's example because his company is a case of this, where the sustainable concept uh, guide, hit, guided him to look for the market, the ideal market, the ideal product, and then... And, and I believe when you think of, of sustainable business models, you're taking the point of uh, starting from the problem and turning it into an opportunity, starting from the world's biggest problems and turning them into the world's biggest opportunities. In reality, we have so many challenges, both in a sustainable and, uh, and on a, in an environmental and in a social uh, point of view, so many billion people, we have billions of people that are struggling, we have the environment that is the world that is being hurt in a crazy way, we have the global warming, and uh, and really, I believe that uh, the business opportunities there, doing good and profiting from this good you do by adding value to others, it's unbelievable. 
I even had the chance of working uh, for 10 years in my since I started my career as a young professional for Natura, has been named now the the biggest B company in the world. And, uh, and I had that uh, experience of starting in a company that was very small when I started. And in 10 years, became to became so important that it could buy its own competitors. When, when I started there, Avon was a monster. Uh, L'Oreal's body shop was growing very big. And, and, and now Natura bought every one of those companies. And even buying those companies in a COVID year, they were named the, the biggest big company in the year. So it's been a great experience of doing things right, taking care of the stakeholders, of the environment, of, of the of people, and achieving excellent uh, business results. So there's no any excuse to do things wrong, no? Excellent. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just uh, throw out one at a time a series of questions that I want you guys uh, to just be conversational about. Uh, so you guys just jump, jump in. So the first one um, – uh, it was kind of a question that our hosts, that Horasis asked. Uh, they asked about how COVID uh, has changed sustainability. Has it made people more aware, less aware, more urgent, less urgent? So the first question I want you guys to just have a conversation about is the impact of uh, the global pandemic of COVID on sustainability. And you may not even think there was one. There is one. It's big. It's little. Go. You guys talk about it. I, yeah, I can, Jared, I can I, I think, oh, go ahead. Sure, sure, go, go ahead, Gary. And Gary, well, you were muted, by the way. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think it's been a tremendous change, and it's um, changed as to how consumers not only look at products and are doing more research because they're buying online for the most part, but it's also an opportunity for the brand to communicate to the consumer and, um, and and to do it in ways that you wouldn't have by just walking into a store. Um, you can, you can actually drill down and learn more about the company, which I think is really important. Sustainability wise. I do think that their uh, consumers are becoming much more aware of health and, and safety issues and are, um, looking for, um, safer, more sustainable products uh, on a whole. And um, I, I was worried in the beginning that with COVID that it would, um, it would change and, and sustainability would go away. But I think it's really focused it a lot more. And uh, it's, I, I think it's going to help the industry um, as far as consumerism is concerned and push companies more towards sustainability. Very interesting. I'd like to hear from both of the others uh, uh, as well, what you guys think about the COVID impact on sustainability. Anrata, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with Gary. I think COVID definitely accelerated, uh, you know, how people think about sustainability. It's almost like, you know, COVID has given us a crash course on, you know, how we should behave. You know, now initially that uh, the message and that communication, which should actually should have gone to, you know, every single person on earth, COVID has done that for us. So, you know, thankfully, there's already some background knowledge on how we should behave as brands and businesses. And now the onus is on us to actually do it on ground. Francisco, go ahead. What's yeah, your thought? Francisco, if you want to go ahead. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure where the, the effect will finish, but I see a, a couple of trends that are interesting. The first one is the consumption one uh, that brought forward by, by Gary. For sure, people understood that uh, when, when you stay at home, uh, then the, 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 the things you use to consume maybe don't, let's say it like this, the importance of the things we were consuming change completely in different ways for different people. We were exposed to the leadership problems we have in our countries. Leaders became very exposed with COVID. So, so that's making a quite a shift. And the other thing is, uh, we had this, we faced this global problem. It was very clear. It was a global problem. And, and we had uh, uh, some, in some, some of the leadership going to a more nationalistic point of view. 
and some of the people trying to go to, for, to a more integrated approach. The coordination of countries wasn't very good. So there we have something else exposed that can influence in the future. Communities gained a big role. So individuals working together is another force that we should look out for. And then is the digital effect. We had a huge digital effect on communication. And, and so I think all these effects are playing in a, in a way of going forward. It's very clear and young generations are demanding for change, especially on the environmental things. And we have a, a lot of movements linked to the, to the social matters. Um, but, but all these effects are playing very, very strongly on it. So let's see how it evolves. I have a positive view in general. So you know what, you just hit on, a, on another really important point that I think we should uh, hear from each of you on next was when you said this younger generation uh, demands sustainability. Mm. There's two reasons uh, companies focus on sustainability. Um, one is because they have to, and the better one is because they want to, because they actually care. But we both know that there's companies all along that spectrum, companies that really you know respect the planet and are doing what they need to do to make a difference, even at the risk of potentially harming their business, like when Patagonia made its vendor decision years ago. There's a lot of examples. And then there's other companies that are doing it either for regulatory reasons or uh, because their competitors that are more sustainable are starting to beat them. So let's start with this. And Gary, you can go first. What is your thought on what really drives sustainability? For example, do you... Talk about do the next generation of customers, for example, willing to pay a little more for your competitor's product because your company cares. Um, what is this next generation of consumers demanding in terms of sustainability and how is that? Yeah, I think here in the United States, we don't have regulations. We, we are seeing this in the, in the EU where they are having uh, one use plastic uh, bans and fines and that sort of thing. Not so much in the United States, but we've been seeing uh, companies that 10 years ago used to have two people in their sustainability department now have hundreds of people in their sustainability department. And it's not because of regulation. It's because that they realize that it's a investment that their business has to make. And they're not, they're not, uh, doing any PR about it, really. They're just doing it as, as an investment, and they realize that it has to be done. And um, the other point being that uh, the consumers are definitely driving this. Uh, we talked to one uh, major children's clothing company, and they told us they loved our ideas. We showed them their savings all across the entire uh, use of our product, and they said, we're not going to change until our consumers tell us that they want us to change. And um, frankly, consumers are being more and more vocal about this. And you can see this on ratings for every single product that you buy. And those ratings reflect back very solidly to the companies. And so I, I think it's a combination of you need both a business plan and you need a sustainability plan. And in the long run, the sustainability plan ends up uh, being um, cost efficient, cost um, negative in the long run. But the second is um, brands trying to keep um, vital uh, with uh, different generations as they're, they're going forward. So I think it's equal. I think it's a, two equal forces going on at once. All right. Uh, the, the very interesting uh, perspective. Anrata, what do you think? We're talking about the two forces that drive sustainability. Right. I think what Gary and, right, what Gary and Francisco earlier mentioned, I feel there has to be four P's of business, right? People, planet, purpose, and profit. And profit being a very important one. No matter how much you care about people, planet, or purpose, if your business is not profitable, you won't be able to do it in the long term. Hence, I feel, you know, the though that Fourth P is towards the end, but it is also one of the most crucial pillars for businesses to function. Uh, what I also feel, you know, like uh, Gary was talking about, um, uh, you know, according to a recent survey, the 69% of people who want to buy a purpose driven brand, however, only, you know, around less than 30% actually end up buying it, right? 
and the so we see a gap between intention to action right there are a lot more people who intend to buy it but there are way less people who are actually doing it and i feel uh, you know one of the reasons that uh, you know we need to start making sustainability as a you know as a default nature right now when people go and you know want to buy water or purchase water the default nature is to buy a plastic bottle like buy a package drinking water right when we started uh, you know this company called janaja just to tell people that you got to bring your own containers to the water vending machines that itself was such a huge behavioral change you know and you know the campaigns that we had to do around something which was so basic but still because sustainability is not the default nature you know of most of us so i think that needs to be done you know sustainability has to become irresistible for people and you know for for this moment to go forward uh, and that was a really interesting point that you made about uh the percentage of people that intended to buy sustainable and you said only 30% of them actually do that's uh that's a huge problem for all of us right that i can tell you the american version of that years ago the us said okay we're going to save the planet everyone's going to recycle and everybody was issued a recycling can and for years and years most families percentage wise never did anything they just threw all their trash out together all the time it took a long time before people and restaurants and businesses actually separated recycling into different piles they just threw it all in the trash the intent was there but at the last mile right which is the consumer finally making a buying decision with their credit card or the consumer actually having to sort trash i'm too busy for that i'll just throw it out so the last mile is a little bit of a problem in getting people uh to respond like you said if they drove it i think uh, gary you said that there were companies that said we're not going to change till our consumer demands it and if our consumer uh, has 100% intent and 30% follow through and uh, we got a problem francisco what do you think i believe the 30% it's very high for some industries working with big corporations what i see is uh, it's very tough for established businesses to decide to change i believe the factor you mentioned the the have to or the need to is working uh, with strength i believe uh, the the main corporations of course are changing are trying to replace plastic uh, if you see the the web pages it's everywhere everyone is doing it but it, it's very tough to get a business model that already exists it's successful it's generating cash you have it in the stock market and it's and it's also tough to get consumers who are getting products for a price and maybe they are using for functional things or for other type of non not not for every category it's easy for the cost consumer to decide to absorb the cost and what i've seen in in many projects is that corporations are not willing to absorb the cost either uh, sometimes even the consumers would pay for it but the the the, the work around to make it happen and the changes in the business model are too too big i believe the opportunity with the one two is for new business units it's for especially for new companies with new founders with a different vision and i believe there the new generations there's a big difference if you divide those percentages per category but also per uh, age range you will find much higher percentage of even the education is much much better in the case you mentioned the the recycling many countries and companies are putting all these recycling bins with different things but no one even knows how the recycling work no one even knows that if you throw something judging a youth pitch competition and a group of young people had a prototype of their product and it was an intelligent waste can it had four entrances four compartments but it had voice recognition so when you walked up it sensed you sensed you and it said what are you throwing out and i said a plastic bottle and it said put it where the blue flashing light is <laughs> and then the next person it said what are you throwing out and he said the rest of my sandwich and he said put it in the red compo it was impressive because the truth is what you said education's not there so people really don't know but you brought no, no. up a point that that you you said that so here's what i want to hear from each of you on there is a cost to sustainability i love to hear from you guys 
How expensive for a company is sustainability and who should pay for that? Should more governments around the world be subsidizing more sustainable more subsidies for companies that meet that? Because the truth is that's a hard decision in a boardroom. I'm a company. I want to be sustainable. And now I'm going to go tell uh, my, my shareholders that I'm about to reduce our profit on every product because somewhere I got to come up with the money for sustainability. Tough conversation. And as Anrata said at the beginning, so who pays the price? The planet. Because in the end, if we don't absorb the cost of sustainability, we just keep, uh, you know, deteriorating our planet because no one's dealing with it. Gary, why don't you start us off on that one? The cost of sustainability, should governments subsidize that more or who pays it? Because it's a hard. Yeah, I think it should be a uh, government should be more involved with it. And again, like I say, in the EU, they are doing that They're and they're doing it punitively by um, by uh, encouraging companies not to use plastic. Um, investment. I say that um, it, it needs to be done by experts and not just by people who are in department that thinks if we could just, you know, use a recycled material, that'll fix it. Uh, I think that it, it in the long run and, and relatively short long run, uh, it actually saves money. Good sustainable design and engineering saves money over the long term. I mean, we were shipping, uh, they're shipping products in boxes with all this air around them. And that's a huge expense. And to design products, you've, you've got to bring in specialists to come in, look at the products, come up with different sizes, different methods, and then design it so that you're not shipping air, that you're shipping the product and with as little material as possible. You're paying less for cartons. You're paying less for bunker fuel for the container ships. You're, it just ends up saving money. So I kind of think this, this um, long-term thing about sustainability being more expensive is true in the very short term. But in the long term, I think that sustainability will make businesses uh, share resources uh, be far more efficient and actually save a great deal more money. That's uh, most definitely the message that we have to get to people because I think the the uneducated just thought process is it must be expensive. I don't know if we want to do it. Anrata, what do you think of that? The cost? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what I believe is, uh, like, suppose, uh, you know, if one of uh, my businesses is sustainable, right, I'm not really having a different product for it. Uh, I'm just, you know, focusing more on the circular economy, right? When I'm asking people to bring their own containers to, you know, collect water, I'm not really, you know, inventing a product. Hence, at some level, organization is not bearing the cost. Right. So I feel it is also very important to come up with these kind of models where we encourage more like, you know, circular economy uh, so that organizations don't have to bear the cost. Because as soon as organizations have to bear the whole cost, the businesses won't be able to run, you know, in the long term. So hence, I feel uh, like, you know, like Gary was uh, talking, uh, definitely governments and also consumers in terms of behavioral change. You know, they should be ready to, you know, accept, you know, those changes and that, that thinking. And again, there are some good examples of that. The one I referred to earlier was years ago, uh, but it was uh, when Patagonia, the clothing company, uh, made a vendor decision to only do business with sustainable vendors, uh, which meant their supply chain sourcing went down, so their pricing went up. And Wall Street in the U.S. predicted that that was a devastatingly bad decision. And in fact, their sales hit a five-year high because their customer, I think, if I recall, they even ran an ad they kind of said, you could pay less for a jacket than we're charging you, but you couldn't save the planet, something like that. You could buy a cheaper product, but it wouldn't plant trees. I'm paraphrasing, but it worked because consumers did say, we will pay part of the cost of sustainability because we care. Interesting. Francisco, what do you think about who? 
Yeah. Well, there again in Patagonia, you have a segment of people that are following and buying from that company that already uh, signals some commitment to those causes, no? So maybe the same action in different industries within work. I Regarding the costs, I believe the, 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 the mindset shift uh, business people need to do more related to the have to that you mentioned before is sustainability is not anymore like reducing damage. It's not anymore like uh, putting a patch on something that's not working on the social level or the environmental level. I agree completely with, with Gary on the that design and, and engineering link to sustainability and, and new business models can uh, work on value innovation, can achieve better value at lower cost. The thing is, when you have the current businesses with already all this installed structure, it's totally difficult to change the business model from one moment to the other. So the, the, the thing they do is they try to to reduce costs, reduce the, the damage. And by doing that, it will depend, uh, the cost will depend on every industry and the, the forces that are, are out there. If you have an oligopoly and the government is demanding certain changes and everyone needs to adapt these changes, probably the customer will pay. In, in each industry, it will play a different dynamic. But what I know is business is going from a, like the old 1900s the com corporation that was producing in scale to reduce costs in a massive way, non-personalized for everyone, to a business in which personalization is very important, to which segmentation in smaller niches is much more important. So in a sense, I believe the future is about marginal costs that will be lower and lower and lower for production. And, uh, and I believe that the... The question is how how much how many how much time these big models of producing at scale at low cost will survive when disrupted by the new designs and the new business models. I, I believe these companies will try to adapt, will cash as much as possible. They are living right now with all this disruption and they are trying to see how to transition to the new format. And it will be tough for them because it's easy being an entrepreneur to build something and grow it. It's not easy being a corporation replacing a huge unit that is bringing profit, bringing cash in for a new unit, for niches, and, and, and playing the new game. So let's see. Excellent points. And, and you know, there, there is a little bit of a place where, when you talk about disruption, where done if it weren't for COVID. So I want to ask each another question. Uh, we'll start with Anrata. Um, and the question is, any ideas you have that, that what we have to do as a world is we have to encourage, right, sustainability uh, all up and down the supply chain. Any other thoughts you can have, you have on how we can drive uh, more interest, more compliance, how we can encourage uh, the investment and the focus on sustainability to grow? I think uh, if we truly have to move towards a more sustainable future, uh, then we got to have more women in the workplace. We got to have more women in the leadership space. I feel uh, once, you know, there's more gender inclusivity that will only lead to more balanced skill set, which will pave, uh, you know, uh, 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 pave the road for a sustainable future. And there have been several studies which said it's not that women are better than men. It's not that. But I feel the balance skill set which is required, only women can bring that. And I think that's really the need of the hour. I, I think that is an excellent point. And yet another important uh, sort of, you know, uh, plea for more inclusion and more diversity uh, because that impacts everything. In the, it, it is in a way it's no different than when design thinking came out and you had left brain people not thinking they needed right brain people around, right? So we were never getting a really diverse set of decision making. So I think uh, we would all agree with you uh, that more women in more of those positions will create a much more diverse solution. Francisco, what's your thought? Any ideas on driving more focus on sustainability? I... 
No, I, I believe the, the more horizontality we've got, we will have, and the world is turning towards horizontal organizations and more smaller organizations and more entrepreneurial drive and more uh, little little groups of people organized to to supply other little groups of people. I believe the world is going towards a place where sustainability will start to improve because the incentives are towards sustainability. But I believe those incentives are kind of random. We 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 are not going to change the world because we are great. We're going to change the world because for some lucky coincidences, the the incentives are in a way that we need to change the world. <laughs> I I'm very I'm usually an optimist, but but in this sense, I believe that we are solving many of the causes that hurt human beings and and the planet just by chance, just mm -hmm. because the things aligned in a good way, and now we're following our incentives, and it will happen. But But it will be a struggle because in, a, in an education, in a cultural, in a taking care of others, in a knowing how to accept difference, communicate with others, uh, we're way behind. Technology is move, moving much, much faster than what we human beings have evolved as, as good human beings. This discussion that we need to have of having more women in the sales, in the workforce, it doesn't make any sense. We, we should already have... That should already be solved, like, and, and that's only the the basis of the pyramid. We're doing so much damage to other human beings that uh, it's it's a pity. But uh, but I believe the trend is good on, on sustainability. Eventually, things are gonna get better. Excellent, thank you. So we just have uh, a few minutes left. Um, Horatius keeps things very tight. I think it will actually shut us off, whether we shut it off or not. Um, so. Why don't you each do a 60-second closing statement? Gary, why don't you go first? Whatever you'd like to share as your final thoughts on brands. and. Well, I, I think one of the biggest focuses that we have now is, are two things. One is climate change, and the other are the huge plastic gyres that are out in the middle of the ocean. And these are two things that are focusing us all on sustainability and will continue to grow. And uh, I think that... Um, it's just being relevant. It's brands being relevant are going to have to move towards sustainability. And uh, it's, it's a business investment that's going to have to happen. Uh, but if you don't have, if you don't start it, you're going to be left behind. So I'm, I'm very optimistic and I'm seeing signs of this um, in businesses around the world. So it's uh It's it's a good time, I think, for us to all be involved in sustainability because it's moving now. Excellent, and thanks for leading the way, Anrada. Yeah, I think uh, sustainability has to become a new norm, and uh, you know we have to make it a a default nature rather than you know having you know making sustainability as something special. And that has to be done, you know, when we keep nudging the customer with the message of hope. I think hope is, you know, one of the biggest powerful tool that can be, you know, leveraged in, especially in times like this. And especially when some, you know, the whole world has seen the onslaught of uh, COVID-19. And, you know, like I mentioned uh, earlier, more inclusive workplace will definitely, you know, help to take the, to take the message forward. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. And by the way, Uh, it's the middle of the night for her in India. For people that don't know that, we really appreciate you staying up to join us. Francisco? Uh, I believe the the world is full of wonderful people that are are really fighting for sustainability and doing things for people and doing things for the environment. It's a, an honor to have shared the panel with you, with Enrada, with Gary, Jeff. On the other hand, I believe the, the world is generating incentives these incentives are linked to a lot of money that can be made for example that's one incentive linked to working in a sustainable way sustainability is also allowing this value innovation sustainable design is something that will allow to to have a, a amazing profitable businesses businesses are, are about solving problems so more and more people and entrepreneurs are realizing that you can have a, a good uh, good uh, profit by doing that. You have more and more funds 
linked to impact investment. Everything that was working, uh, many, many of the venture capitalists are going towards that way. So, so I believe that the world is kind of improved, but uh, how we do things and how much authenticity we have in trying to make this happen will, will change the how and will change the timing and will change how many people will continue suffering in the middle. So I Excellent. believe we need to pay a lot of attention to that. Excellent. Well, I want to thank each of your panelists. Thank you guys so much for your time and your encouragement. I think you shared a lot of great thoughts on what we as a world need to do for sustainability. And you gave examples. Uh, Gary even physically showed us one. <laughs> I really so can see what this means. And I think you guys gave some great positive points of light about the fact. Here's some of the key things to remember. In the long run, end to end, sustainability is cheaper, not more expensive. Yep. And that's a myth that we have to solve. Second, the next generation of consumers cares about sustainability. They do not want to buy products and do business with 